ladies and gentlemen, again let me say welcome to our home and thank you for taking the time to be here. I'm well aware that whether you're here in person or through the medium of motion picture, that for most of you it's not easy to fit meetings of this kind into your schedules. But the fact that you are here indicates that you do have an interest in the subject and that means there's a tremendous obligation on my part to develop that subject with the kind of usable information that will make it worth your while. So in order not to waste any of your time, let's dispense with the usual preliminaries and get right down to the business at hand. The title of this presentation is More Deadly Than War, but the subject matter itself is Revolution. We're going to examine in quite a bit of detail the communist theory and practice of revolution, particularly as applied to the United States. Now this will not be something dreamed up out of thin air. This will be the strategy as taught by them and advocated by them in their own manuals, in their textbooks, and in their schools. Now the organization of this material will lead to three rather startling conclusions. The first is that the communist program for revolution in America is divided into two phases, violent and nonviolent. The second conclusion is that the strategy for violent revolution calls for chaos, anarchy, mass confusion and panic among the people, a crisis in government, and then out of the vacuum, the sudden seizure of power by communist-led guerrilla bands. The third conclusion is that the nonviolent phase of revolution actually is more important to the communists and more potentially dangerous to us. Now the strategy for this phase calls for the gradual transition of our government into a communist regime done peacefully and legally but under the banner of socialism. This then is the outline of the material that lies ahead. So let's start right at the beginning with conclusion number one which is that the communist program for revolution in America is divided into two phases, violent and nonviolent. Now a good place to begin is with this communist booklet entitled On the Nature of Revolution, the Marxist Theory of Social Change. It was written by Herbert Aptheker, one of the leading theoreticians of the Communist Party in this country. And on page 11, Aptheker says, The equating of violence with the nature and process of revolution is not correct. Violence may or may not appear in such a process, and its presence or absence is not a determining feature of the definition. Now this comes as quite a surprise to many of us because for years we've been used to thinking of communist revolutions only as those which involve the overthrow of governments by force and violence. Now that entire phrase has been written and spoken so often as a single concept that many of us haven't even considered the possibility that the communists might have another approach to their goal, that they might overthrow the government without force and violence, that they might in fact plan to come to power through means that properly could be called peace and politics. Now in order to go any further, it'll be necessary for us to define a few terms. When the communists speak of the two kinds of revolution, they don't come right out and say so in plain English. Of course not. You see, they claim to be practicing something called scientific Marxism. And so they have to dress up these crude concepts in elaborate phraseology. For instance, when the communists speak of violent revolution, they describe it as a war of national liberation. Now the so-called theory behind this is that the people of the country marked for takeover supposedly are an oppressed people. They're dominated by an imperialistic foreign power that has colonized them and exploited them. And so the communists claim that it's their duty, their historic duty, to liberate them from the yoke of fascism or imperialism or colonialism or whatever. Now, naturally, the communist orientation of the movement is played down. They prefer to identify themselves usually as a people's army of liberation or a national liberation front. Of course, this is the kind of guerrilla warfare we've seen used in China, Algeria, Cuba, South Vietnam, and many other places around the world. But there are other phrases also used to describe the same process. Occasionally, they'll refer to this violent type of revolution as an anti-imperialist war or an anti-colonialist war, but they all equal the same thing. 
wars of national liberation, anti-imperialist wars, and anti-colonialist wars are all phrases used to describe that aspect of communist revolution aimed at overthrowing the government by means of force and violence. To describe their nonviolent revolution, the communists most often use the term proletarian revolution, but they also refer to it as the socialist revolution and sometimes as the anti-monopoly struggle. But here again, they all add up to the same thing. The proletarian revolution, the socialist revolution, and the anti-monopoly struggle are all merely different ways in which the communists describe their strategy for overthrowing the government through non-violent means. Well, all right, having defined some of the key phrases, we can return now to the communist literature and be able to understand what they mean when they use these words. Now, in 1960, the representatives from communist parties all over the world gathered in Moscow and issued a joint declaration which included this statement. Our time, whose main content is the transition of capitalism to socialism, is a time of socialist revolutions and national liberation revolutions. In other words, simply stated, we're living in an era of two kinds of revolution, one violent and the other nonviolent. Now, here's a document published by the Communist Party in this country in 1968. It's entitled, The New Program of the Communist Party USA, a Second Draft. And on this subject, here's what it says. Contemporary revolutions bear two distinctive marks. They are socialist, they are anti-imperialist. More than a billion human beings are now embarked on socialist revolution. A larger number is in varying stages of revolution for national liberation. Well, in order to relate this general concept of two kinds of revolution to the specific application here in the United States, it'll be necessary for us to examine rather closely the communist position on what they describe as the Negro question. Now, basically summarized, the communist position on the Negro question is as follows. As early as 1928, the communists declared that the racial differences among our people constituted the weakest and most vulnerable point in our social fabric. By constantly probing and straining at this one spot, they calculated that eventually the cloth could be torn apart and that Americans could be divided, weakened, and perhaps even set against each other in open combat. They said in no unmistakable terms that the Negro people, because of their secondary social status and their predominant working class composition, offered greater revolutionary possibilities than any other cross-section of the population. To develop these possibilities, the communists proclaimed that the American Negro constituted a separate nation within a nation, a colony within the continental borders of the United States. The people of this nation were said to be oppressed and exploited by colonialist, imperialist, racist America. Consequently, the Communist Party called for their liberation, their right to self-determination, to break away from the United States and to set up their own nation within our borders. Now, to bring this about, of course, force and violence must be used. A war of national liberation must be fought. The territory designated for this nation to be liberated was the Black Belt in the South, those counties and states in which the Negro population was dominant. When established, the new nation was to have a Soviet-type government and be totally subservient to the Communist Party. But, and this is extremely important, the Communists made it clear from the very beginning that they could never hope to capture all of the United States with a war of national liberation, only part of it. You see, elsewhere in the world, the segment of the population supposedly liberated by the communists has been a majority segment.